to Turkey. Uh, he uh, heard that people had accused him of running away from the plague and of uh, rejecting the will of God. And so he decided to sit down and he penned a plague treatise. And um, in this treatise, he laid out his belief that the plague was transmissible, that it was contagious. He talked about that belief uh, as occurring through the corruption of the air and of this corruption being caused by spirits and of then infecting the body and leading to the death and the proximity to people who've been infected was therefore dangerous. He did not reflect upon any of the scriptural sources he could have drawn upon, which would have argued that the plague was a martyrdom and therefore nothing to be feared. And he made a strong argument that the government, the Ottoman government that, uh, to which he was looking for financial support, this should strengthen the, uh, the life of the Muslim community by protecting people from this, this pandemic. This treatise did not go unnoticed and it had a long afterlife and was quoted in the 19th century by an Algerian scholar when he made his own argument for the quarantine. I start here because this is what one example of a type of thinking in a treatise in the Muslim world that um, had deep roots that went back to the seventh century and which would continue in some way up until today. That is to say, it represents a, a one example of how a number of different discourses could come together and could be used to articulate a response to a challenge which then as now has given humankind a sense of being overwhelmed. So let's, let's, let's go back for a second. What, what do we know about how Muslims responded to epidemic disease in the Middle East? And this is also true for uh, much of Iberia during the centuries that, uh, that, um, that Muslims were living there. The, our first problem that we confront right off the bat is that we conceive of disease in the past generally the same way we do today. I'm sure that I don't have to tell anybody in the audience right now that there is something called contagion and that if you sp spend time near other people without a mask in an enclosed space that you who and that it is highly likely that you will get corona from them if they have it. This entire way of thinking about disease and contagion, however, is based upon a framework which was uh, created in the 19th century um, by Louis Pasteur and his students and which is predicated upon us coming to collectively believe in invisible small creatures that can infect us, right? And prior to that, and, and in part that has a lot to do with the fact that now we have instruments where we can actually see um, the entities that, that, that infect us. Um, prior to that, there, were, there was no such consensus. And so the, the chief danger we face then as students of epidemic disease and of the way that societies responded to it in the past is of needing to refrain to project our own understandings of science today on these past examples, right? And as we do so, there is another master narrative uh, looming over us that, we, that, that also is present and even is present in many conversations around COVID today, which is to say that of there being a supposed conflict between religion and science on some level, that, that it's impossible, or at least that there's a tension there between the belief in an omnipotent God, which is the, the belief which is common to all three Abrahamic monotheisms, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and on the other hand, a, a, an ability to look into and to investigate the, um, the workings of, of God in the natural world or the existence of natural law as it came to be known uh, in, in some parts of the Western tradition. That is to say then that there is a, we, we should remind ourselves of the limits of empiricism. What we today take for granted and what we think we can see, that is not something which we should assume that those in the past had similar, had similar conceptions of. It was entirely possible, as we will come to see, for someone to see one person fall ill of the plague and the next person nearby them not get the plague and therefore to, uh, to question the entire concept of contagion. Another point that I want to, to set out there as I set out these central theoretical points is our understanding of religion. And here I'm kind of giving away the game um, because this is something I'll come back to at the end of my talk as well. A simplistic way of understanding religion is that if one wants to know, for example, what Christians think, one merely has to open the New Testament and, and read 
and there one won't find an answer. And similarly, and this has been often the case in West and in, in sort of European and um, uh, Europeanist views of the Muslim world, if you want to know what Muslims think, you merely go to their scriptures, you go to the Quran or you go to the Hadith, that is to say the sayings of the actions of the prophet, and you will learn what their opinion is on a certain thing. And, the, and this again is a, is a wonderful moment for epidemic disease to, to give us a sense of actually how discursive and dynamic religion is as a category. For we will see that by Muslim scholars drew upon a certain defined number of sources that not all of those sources were scriptural and that the scripture was seldom emphasized or presented and or interpreted in the same way. What this does then is it should give us some what we might call a kind of epistemological humility that we should not look to judge the societies of the past by our contemporary standards and understanding, and that we should also not posit that unified understandings of a, of a certain religious tradition or of an under scientific, uh, if you so will, understanding of disease um, was able to be transmitted over time without changing as it went. So in other more uh, prosaic historian terms, the past is contingent upon its context, right? And so this should help us to, to, to forestall us relying too much on broader teleological readings, such as to say the rise of a single understanding of disease and to measure past societies by that. Okay. So with that, I, I gesture here to two books you see on the far side. I have placed my own book, Infectious Ideas, which was mentioned in my introduction. But before that, there, there really the, the study of the, of the of plague in the Muslim world was set off by a giant in the field by Michael Doles, who wrote The Black Death in, in the, the Middle East, which is now over 40 years old, but really was the first monograph in any um, European language or possible language that I know of to try to set out a, a broad overview of the historical impact of the Black Death of the 14th century on the Muslim world. And uh, my book builds on Dole's, challenges some of its arguments, but that this is, this is kind of the, the beginning of what we might call a new wave and a deeper understanding of epidemic disease in the Muslim world now, which has been going on for the past 50 years, beginning with Dole's work. So how to begin? Where do Muslim understandings of epidemic disease come from? The first thing to say is, I'd like you to start by considering the Islamic world part of, quote unquote, the West. What we see here is the Mediterranean was became the locale for the shared emergence of uh, following the um, separation of a Hellenized Roman Empire. It, it became the locale for the emergence of a series of political units that were identified with Abrahamic monotheism of one stripe or another, chiefly Christianity and later Islam. So these are what we might see as variants on a theme. And although that this, this come, might come as a, initially a, a rather strange way of putting it, what it, it, because many people conceive of Islam as other or the East or something which is not part of quote unquote the West, um, Spain of course is a, uh, a, a place where much more nuanced if occasionally combative views on the subject are, are put forward, it should help us to begin understanding the way in which Muslim societies responded to epidemic disease by understanding that the basic precepts here were the same, that they were shared by uh, Christian and, and Jewish populations in the Mediterranean as well. The main difference here, however, is that the early Muslim community, as opposed to the early Jewish or the formative Jewish or the formative Christian community, um, it had a direct experience of, of plague and epidemic disease. So it, that experience is reflected in the early scriptural sources, specifically in the Muslim tradition, in the sayings and the actions of the Prophet Muhammad. So when we come then to the beginning of the response of the Muslim um, community to epidemic disease, the, the early Muslims are drawing on, uh, and I'm talking here in the, in the seventh, eighth centuries, most of these initial sources are written down in the ninth centuries under the Abbasid Caliphate based in Baghdad. They have a series of intellectual traditions on which they're drawing. The first one is what we might call more broadly humoral or Galenic medicine. That is to say that the bodies are composed of, uh, of four humors of blood and phlegm and black bile and yellow bile, and that the, the health is a result 
of these being in the proper alignment. Right? This, this understanding of what health is and of disease being a imbalance of this humoral alignment is something that was shared and became the basic for framework of humoral medicine throughout the Middle Ages and well into the early modern period. Disease in a monotheistic framework such as this is, is striking because on the one hand, it is seen as an opportunity to reflect upon the imminence of God and to reflect upon our own mortality in this world and to align ourselves properly towards the world to come. On the other hand, it is an affliction and something to struggle against and something to try to remedy. And so there are some social traditions which seem pretty instinctive, that is to say, to flee from disease, but that it has to be balanced with the need of caring for the sick. And so when we look at the early examples of scriptural traditions in the Muslim world, we find these not in the Quran itself, which, which uh, refers to disease only rather obliquely, but in the much larger and more extensive corpus of the traditions related to the uh, Prophet Muhammad. And here we find um, a wide variety of, of texts. On the one hand, we have clear statements that one should not water sick animals with healthy animals, that one should not eat with lepers. And um, on the other hand, we also have a denial of the presence of uh, a phenomenon of contagion with the explanation that this was a denial, or this is how later Muslim uh, theologians looking back would understand it, that this was a denial of disease's ability to transmit itself by itself. And that in fact, instead, this had to be understood as something that uh, that uh, God did. And a particularly dramatic example of one of these prophetic traditions, a Bedouin comes to Prophet Muhammad and says, uh, essentially in the context of the Prophet having denied the existence of contagion and a, and a, at a prior time, says to him, but what about you know, my camels when they're healthy and then a mangy camel comes and settles amongst them and they become mangy, what's with that? And the Prophet Muhammad responds and he says, well, who do you think infected the first camel? Thereby, making a comment on causality, but also drawing people's awareness to the fact that God needs to be understood as the ultimate cause of everything. So this is the context then in which the early Muslim community responded to, to plague. Um, plague itself comes up at one particular moment. The Prophet Muhammad, um, who traditionally is not understood ever to have left the Arabian Peninsula, did not experience plague, but shortly after his death, the Muslim army in, in what is today um, Israel, Palestine at Emmaus, um, they were there on their way to, to fight the Byzantines. Um, they experienced a wave of plague in which many of them uh, died. And the second Caliph Omar at that time, he had set out with an army for Syria and he came and he heard that the plague had broken out. And he said, um, you know, do I go ahead? Do I go back? And other prophetic companions around him, they said, well, what, what about, you know, if God has decreed it? And Omar said, well, I, I think I'm going to flee from the will of God to the will of God, in a sense, arguing that God had created both the opportunity to advance, but also the opportunity to retreat from something like epidemic disease. And at that moment, another prophetic companion came forward and said, actually, I heard for the prophets say that if you hear about the plague breaking out somewhere, you should not advance and you should not leave such an area if you were there. Now, I set this tradition there for you, and I'll come back to it later, because some uh, more contemporaneous moments would, would draw upon it as a justification of quarantine, which I'm going to, to take issue with. So that's the context that we have. Within this humoral paradigm, we find that we have uh, physicians, doctors in the Muslim world. And you see here a number of them. Ibn Sahil and Rabban Tabari, who in his Firdaus al-Hikmah, or, or um, so paradise of wisdom, if you so will, gives us a list of contagious diseases, of which the plague is interestingly not one, but, but um, um, scabies, mange, uh, leprosy. Uh, the Christian doctor, Kusta ibn Luka, writes an actual treatise just on contagion. And he uh, argues as and, and lays out here that the root of contagion is localized miasma, miasma being corrupted air. And so this understanding of being able to reconcile a humoral paradigm with an idea of, the, of, of diseases and epidemics of something that had already been clear within classical medicine that if you're going to have a common disease to everyone, it has to have a common cause. And the common cause could only be understood in terms of epidemics, in terms of, as, as air, as corrupted air. Under Muhammad al-Razi, and you see us here with the dates moving forward from the 9th into the 10th century of the 
of the Christian era, we are given a list of, of contagious diseases. And with Ibn Sina or Avicenna, we have yet again a, 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 an argument for the contagious nature of specific diseases, especially leprosy at that time. And yet what is striking here is that even though the, the, uh, the early Muslim community had experienced plague, plague is not in these treatises, medical treatises designated as contagious at this point in time, largely because it would seem that these societies of the 9th and 10th and 11th centuries were not themselves experiencing plague, that the plague of what's sometimes referred to as the Justinian plague had ceased in roughly the 8th century, as far as we know, although some new historical work is taking issue with this. And then we will see that the plague becomes regarded as contagious only following the outbreak of the Black Death in the 14th century. Side by side with what we can call here the Scalenic humoral tradition and, and uh, amongst Muslim authors, though, we also have a genre of something called prophetic medicine, which drew upon things that the Prophet Muhammad had said, and then set them in um, alongside Galenic uh, humoral theory. So what is striking about that is that it... Um, uh, it, gave, it gave the opportunity of having scriptural sources, but the scriptural sources themselves were always set and understood within the Galenic uh, framework. So, so much on the, the medical tradition. Then, on the other hand, we have the prophetic hadith, the contagion, the, the, on contagion and on um, contagious diseases. And as I've already pointed out to you, these, these hadith were in part could be seen as contradictory, right? I mean, we have some which said there is no contagion and we have other ones saying you should avoid the sick or leprosy. We have the example of the Caliph Omar at this place called Sar on his way to, uh, to Syria. We have another fellow by the name of Mu'ad bin Jebel who's, who's at that plague uh, in Emmaus and who there asks, he, has a, a, he goes up on a minbar in a mosque and he gives a, a sermon, a khutbah, and he says, oh, God, you know, if, if it's the, you know, please let me uh, be martyred through this disease. Um, and so what is striking about that is that in that, with that tradition, a strain of thought in the Islamic world then is, comes to understand that plague is different from other diseases because those people who die by it will find martyrdom. And this is, this, is, this is important for us to keep in mind because it is a resource in the tradition which some scholars later sort of draw upon and some do not. But it marks out plague specifically as, uh, as distinct from other diseases. What it also did, however, is it gave later scholars from the 9th, 10th century and forward a problem. Some of the things the prophet had said and in scripture led people to believe that there was no contagion and that one can simply trust in God. Either and because, or that if, even if there is contagion, that dying of the plague is, is, is a good thing or because it leads you to becoming a martyr. Or you also had these other traditions, such as the Caliph Omar Tzach saying, I'm gonna move, you know, go flee from the will of God to the will of God. And so this called for something that scholars love to do, which is commentary, and also along with commentary, reconciliation of apparently contradictory materials. On some level, that one can argue that this is the essence of all scholarship even today as well. And so with Ibn Qutayba in the ninth century already, we see here a, a, an argument for reconciling these different prophetic uh, traditions, and it, it continues forward after him. And so we see then that uh, the Muslim scholars are able to draw upon a wide variety of materials here, sometimes em emphasizing one or the other, but also being able to argue things that, uh, making an argument that, you know, what the prophet said when he, on the one hand, he himself uh, apparently is related to having eaten with lepers, but he told others to run away from lepers as if they were lions. Uh, for example, is that perhaps he was dealing with uh, addressing different types of Muslims within the Muslim community, those whose hearts could be strong enough to bear the challenge that was born to them by sitting close to someone with epidemic disease. So it continued to be a matter of dispute. And it was not a case of the entire Muslim community agreeing, but there was clearly an anxiety about preserving the importance of the prominence of the divine at the same time that you had to deal with what was very clearly a dangerous series of diseases which transmitted themselves, right? And so here 
But we also see that these religious commentaries on things that the prophet had said and done, they also drew on medical and theological materials. So we cannot clearly differentiate in this moment between the different sources that were being drawn upon or project some understanding of modern science or even our contemporary understanding of religion as something which largely relates to beliefs and perhaps not not uh, beliefs regarding the, the hereafter and not necessarily to, to, um, to the way in which one should act in response to epidemic disease. Although to be fair, there are many people today who, have, who are struggling with precisely these same issues. But we, so we should be careful then about understanding the complexity of these different materials. Let me give you an example of somebody who kind of solved this conundrum, all right? Because there is this problem, how? Do we, if, if God is, can do anything, if he can do it and, and if he is good, then why should we protect ourselves from disease? After all, if God wants us to die, why not just, not just um, die at that moment in time, right? And there was a theological school of thought here among many, but not all Muslims, um, known as occasionalism, which in its a simple, put simply means that God creates the world at each and every moment and each and everything within that world he creates at each and every moment and there is no necessary link between one thing and the next. So if you are a hardcore believer in natural law sort of post enlightenment, this idea of occasionalism will be very troubling to you because it will seem like there's to you perhaps like there's no way uh, of, of understanding natural order and that one cannot foretell the future based on the past. This would be a false understanding, according to our, our Muslim theologians. And to give you here a particularly dramatic example from a very influential one of them, this is Al-Ghazali, who passed away in a very memorable date for my students when they have to, to study Al-Ghazali in 1111. He solved this problem nicely. And he, I'm gonna, I'll let you read the quote on the, on the screen if you wish. And I'll just, just to summarize, the essential point here is, well, yes, obviously God creates everything and there is no necessary link between one you know, thing and the next and fires don't always have to be hot. For example, how that's this, by the way, is an explanation of the miracles of how prophets might walk through fire. God just takes away the characteristic of heat from them at that moment or does not create it there. But at the same time, and this is true of medicine, if you're going to go into battle, you carry armor and a sword, right? And if you were going to go and, and, and go and pray in the mosque and you're riding a camel, you take your camel there, but you hobble your camel. You can trust in God, this is another prophetic saying, but hobble your camel first. So you have to take responsibility for the habitual fashion and this notion of habit, of God's habit uh, looms large and God's wisdom looms large amongst many of these theologians. You have to take responsibility for the way that God has habitually created things and among those is disease. Right. So if you know, for example, that there might be a thief, I'm in Berlin, bicycles are stolen a lot. I'm going to go and I'm going to secure my bike with two locks to make sure that thieves don't take it. But that is not because I don't believe that that has any ability to affect God's creation. It is simply that I respect the fact that God has created things in a certain way where I have responsibility for my actions. And the same is true of my health in the same framework, right? So you use medicine, you have an ability to using medicine does not in any way go against your belief in God. So this point may seem to be, uh, well, depending on where you come from and your own religious beliefs today, this may be a more or less salient point. But what it should do is show us that Muslim theologians were able, once their religious tradition had had several centuries to become mature in its, uh, its understanding and discussion of difficult theological points, to reconcile medical action and response towards disease, epidemic diseases among them, along with a spiritual orientation to the divine at every moment. And we should not take this to, as uh, Ghazali is the elite of the elite when it comes to Islamic scholarship, and not take that as necessarily representative of the views of all Muslims, but it does show us that scholars within the tradition were able to clearly and elegantly um, reconcile the different materials with which they were working in face of this challenge of responsibility both to the world to come and to the world in which they lived. Following the Black Death, and, and just to, to perhaps, again, we live in a moment, a time where our understanding of the trauma caused by, by epidemic disease is 
um, is ready. It's right with us. We're all, to some extent, I believe, in these days, traumatized by what we are seeing around us, and specifically what we're witnessing right now in, in India. Um, let us remember, looking back, that in the 14th century, between 30 to 50 to 60 percent of the population of the Mediterranean, and then subsequently also of the broader Middle, Middle East, of Central and Northern Europe, and we're not as well informed of the demographic effects on West Africa and on Central Asia, but we're talking about a fatality here of about half the population. It was immense and incredibly uh, traumatic. Um, it also produced, more to the point perhaps for this discussion, a new genre of writing, something called a plague treatise in, in, in the Muslim world, where people did, specifically took up the issue of the plague. And they combined and they drew upon uh, a series of other genres. One of them was legal decisions or fatawa. You might have heard of fatwas. Fatwas are simply legal opinions. It's what a legal scholar might writes down and says, this is what I think you should do in such a case. It has no legal binding um, uh, effects. It's not a decision from a judge, but it does have spiritual authority. And the plague treatises drew on this because they instructed believers to behave in certain ways. And they also drew upon the Hadith commentaries that I described before, reconciling and discussing the different things that the prophet said and did, and as well as other more literary works, not to mention uh, medical works as well. And I just want to briefly pause on four of these treatises um, because they're at the heart of our broader understanding of Muslim responses to epidemic disease. When Michael Doles, you remember him back from the beginning, he wrote the book on the Black Death in the Middle East. When he wrote his, his, his book back in the 1970s, he was particularly interested in the plague treatise uh, in the printed version, which you see here on, on the right. Uh, this is Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani's. It's a 15th century Egyptian treatise, Bedr al-Ma'un fi Fadl Da'un, or the, the full beaker on the virtue of the plague. So it's actually entitled, it was a long treatise in which he really emphasized the beneficial nature of the plague because it produced martyrdom. We should not understand this in a facile fashion. Ibn Hajar lost two of his daughters in the 1420s to the, to the plague. Uh, it was, it was a, a sub, you know, so obviously he had a personal loss, was deep in here, but his understanding of his religious tradition was that this was, a, was for believers who had good intention and trusted in God, then this could guarantee your access to, to heaven and the world to come. At the other end, and not too far from where my audience in Barcelona is, in Almeria, um, Ibn Khatima was writing also at the same time, uh, well, a little earlier, actually, as you can see from the dates here, about two or three generations earlier before Ibn Hajar. And he came up with a very different way of looking at it. And he, he, he did not discuss martyrdom at all. And he gave actually fine observations regarding the danger of going to the old clothes markets and how one should not buy the clothes of people who had had died of, of, of the plague. So it's a strong argument for the transmission uh, and the contagious nature. And that is also true for his Grenadan compatriot and contemporary, Ibn al-Khatib. And so where we find these treatises in Al-Andalus, which are defending the transmissibility and contagious nature, Ibn Hajar, on the other hand, said, you know what? The plague is not contagious. This is nonsense. I've witnessed houses in, 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 in Cairo where one person is struck down by the plague and nobody else in that house suffers at all. They all live. And then I've witnessed other houses where it just open, jumps over them entirely and yet other houses where they all die. There's no rhyme or reason to this. It doesn't have to do with proximity to people, right? And I mentioned that point because Ibn Hajar would also go on to believe that jinn or spirits cause the plague. But in doing so, he had radical, radically empirical um, evidence and arguments. I'll point out that you also believe in unseen spirits, or shall we say unseen, unseen entities when it comes to the transmissibility of COVID-19, or in this also the bubonic plague. Um, you just have a different name for them. The, the problem for Ibn Hajar was that he didn't understand the vector. And this wasn't something that we understood in general until the end of the 19th century. That is to say that bubonic plague is transmitted generally by fleas off of rats. And so that it doesn't, it's not generally transmitted from one person to another. It's actually not contagious in that sense, unless it's pneumonic and, and in the lungs, it's, it's infectious. It comes from by a vector off of a rat by a, through a flea. So this would explain the differentiated fate of the people he was looking at. And it would also then explain Ibn Khatima's views in Al-Andalus 
um, about why one shouldn't buy the clothes of, uh, and Ibn Khatima's understanding, this was because the clothes contained something of the miasma or of the corrupted air, which had caused the, the plague and uh, with the, those who, uh, their, their former owners, those who had died. But um, in our understanding today, we would of course want to read back into it as being the clothes containing fleas of those people who would, uh, would transmit the disease onwards. Yet a third example is that of Ibn that I opened this, this talk with, who believed in the conta in contagious nature of plague and believed that it was caused by jinn, and so reconciled, and, um, but said that the jinn themselves were working through the corruption of the air. They were the cause of the corruption of the air. And so he reconciled the spiritual understanding of there being creatures out there who were trying to, uh, to, to hurt mankind, while at the same time saying that the plague was contagious and also never mentioning the doctrine of contagion. A yet much later example of this genre is that of al-Shakani in Yemen in the 19th century, so we're moving quite forward in time here, who actually basically largely summarized the discussions of Ibn Hajar in his own defense uh, of um, the plague not, not being, being contagious. Therefore, he can be contemporary with also those, those uh, anti-contagionists in London at the same time who argued against the contagious nature of the plague. So this then is the, is the treatise which emerges in response to this massive traumatic experience of epidemic disease that, that, that just goes through the, uh, the Mediterranean world uh, in the 14th century. Yet another element here is the occult. When we look at these treatises, we find in them description medical understandings so based on tumoral medicine. We find reconciliations of different types of prophetic tradition. We find observations such as of the old clothes market in Almeria or of Ibn Hajar walking through the streets of Cairo and observing which houses were struck down or not. We also find a large number of prayers and practices. And here's, I've given you one page from a, a manuscript copy of uh, Bailuni's uh, 17th century plague treatise. Also, this is also from, um, from Egypt. And that is, in the, it, it shows you the number of the names of, of God, which can be written down here on paper and hung on the door to protect you from, from disease. And the occult is a, a problem category uh, for many people because it's regarded in our kind of post- uh, um, uh, enlightenment, um, or if you wish to take more of a Weberian understanding of, of this, that is to say that it, our post-enchantment understanding of the world, that uh, it is something that is a pseudo-pseudo-belief or a false belief. But when we look back into this time period, it essentially just means a belief in something unseen, that is, which is hidden, right? And so here we have the belief that calling and praying to God and putting one's faith in at such amulets would both calm the spirit and the soul, right? That there's a humoral basis there on that helping out the health, simply the calming of, of one's interior world, but also that of calling upon the divine to intervene, right? And as such, um, you know, the, the prominence of amulets and prayers and their the fact that these would be things which would be much more accessible to the broader population as getting access to good medical care uh, would have been something that would be only accessible to um, relative elites and largely in urban areas, right? This is not to be understood as magic. This is to be understood as a belief in God, the power of the divine to work through the occult. I say it's not supposed to be, not should not be understood as magic simply because magic uh, is to call upon um, a power other than God. And that is something which all of the, the religious scholars I'm talking about today uh, were, uh, as, as you might imagine, um, very critical of. Right. So I mentioned here the trap of the occult, because in some of the early Orientalist texts of the 19th and 20th centuries, the presence of such prayers and amulets in writings on the plague, they would write off purely as superstition or as evidence of backwardness or not yet having reached a modern understandings of disease. Whereas I think what we see here is much more a, a sense of a, a broader desire to interact with the spiritual demands of a population that is in a situation of trauma and to give people things that they can, they can hold on to to do alongside with other um, medical things such as bringing one's humors into better alignment in order to strengthen one's resistance to disease, right? 
So I'm going to give you another example here um, of uh, an author who's dear to my heart. This is a Moroccan polymath, Al-Hassan al yusi he's from the 17th century, as you can see. And uh, he's a, he's a, I've spent a lot of time with this particular scholar and I've translated one of his, his works into English. And I'm, I'm giving here from a manuscript that I've only found much more recently. This is actually a 20th century manuscript, but it quotes some lines of of poetry from al -Yusi. First of all, it cites a long passage from Ibn Khatima's uh, 14th century plague treatise, showing us that these plague treatises also travel over time, that people, later scholars, can reach back and draw upon pre on precedents who took positions similar to the ones that they themselves are, are sympathetic to. And al -Yusi, the Meriti, this, this scholar who's a teacher of al -Yusi, after citing this long passage by Ibn Khatima, he quotes this um, this poem by, by al Yusi, as you can see here, there's no cure for an epidemic but flight and distancing yourself from it, take heed. Most scholars hold the tradition to be one of disapproval. Some recommend flight when it appears. Now this is obviously, it's not translated to what I would call eloquent poetry. More importantly though, it refers back to one of the prophetic traditions that I introduced earlier on. When it says here, most scholars hold the tradition to be one of disapproval. And that is to say the tradition that the prophet um, has, had, had been reported to have said by his companion, Amr al-As at, at Saf to the uh, Caliph Omar, when he said, I heard the prophet say that if it breaks out, you should not enter into that area. And if you are there, you should not leave it, right? Now, al see here is clearly going back and saying, well, that's fine and good that that was related from the prophet, but I want you to understand that not as an imperative of forbidding you from leaving a place where the plague broke out, but as a suggestion of saying that it wouldn't be a good idea for you to do so, but you might, if you want to, go and do it, right? That's hold the tradition to be one of disapproval. This is a, is a good example of a uh, productively um, creative uh, interpretation of prior, prior prophetic tradition to justify the position of a, a scholar who firmly believes in the transmissible nature of disease and wishes to preserve his fellow Muslim from its ravages. Now, you may be asking, it's fine and well, we understand that you spend your time with intellectual history and that you like to read about all of these theoretical ideas and what these elite male scholars said in their writings, but what evidence do we have for what Muslims really did? And that's a good point. There we have to turn to a different source, and that is largely historical chronicles. And here you have an example um, from Ibn al-Kathir, a 14th century scholar, and describing the effects of the plague in Damascus. And we find that as um, the people came together in prayer, sometimes they came together outside of cities and prayed in the same way that they would pray for the lifting of a draught. Um, they cared for each other. We have certain scholars, I don't have time to go into all the details, but a contemporary of Ibn al-Khatib in 14th century Granada, he's one of his teachers actually, a fellow by the name of Ibn Luk, who said, how terrible would it be that we would abandon our fellow Muslims in a time of need? We need to stay and take care of them in their, in their, when they are ill. And Ibn Ajiba in Morocco in the late um, 18th, early 19th century would make the same argument. You know, it's from a position of faith of a person who truly believes in God, we need to stay and, and take care of our fellow believers. We also have examples of Muslims who ran, ran away, who fled, including some prominent rulers who, who chose to withdraw to the countryside, and others who chose to um, do certain things like uh, readjust their humors at times through bleeding, um, at times through changes in diet. Um, and so we have a wide variety of different responses uh, of which these plague treatises that I've been talking about give us a sense but are hardly comprehensive. Moving forward in time, and I'm giving you here for those of you who are more interested and in, uh, a sense of the range of scholarship that's really emerged over the last a few decades on this issue, we see that the effects of epidemic disease have a, a broad, um, and specifically of the plague, have a, a wide ranging series of differentiated effects over the Muslim world. And in the 16th century, as the state and the Ottoman state, which is controls much of, of uh, the Muslim Mediterranean at the time, we see a strengthening of 
um, a, a worry about the impact of such disease on the strength of the state and its ability also to wage war and, and to levy taxes. And we begin to see an interest in public health. But we do not see yet an interest uh, in quarantine. And so, in, in that is to say, in, in isolating people who are healthy until you see whether they are sick or not. I'll, I'll point out that this is different. I think most of us are now quite familiar with the concept of quarantine, but this is distinct from the idea of isolating the sick. The quarantine isolates the healthy until you can be aware of whether they are sick or not. And it is a relatively recent uh, phenomenon. And the earliest example I believe we have is the 14th century in Dubrovnik or Ragusa in what, into modern day Croatia, and then in, in the, by the 15th century in Venice. Um, and, and some of the books here, for those of you who are interested to read further, give you uh, more insight into some of the, the details here. Nuket Varlik's um, award-winning book on plague and empire in the early modern Mediterranean world really gives you an overview of the experience of, of, of the, the plague in the Ottoman world. Um, Stuart Borsch's Black Death is a, is a phenomenal comparative example of how two areas of similar demographic importance, England and Egypt, could be differentially affected by an epidemic that um, had a similar demographic effect, but on the one hand, because of how agriculture was organized in each country, ultimately led to an increase of the economy in England and a collapse of the irrigation system um, in Egypt that it would not recover from for centuries. Um, finally, Ruth McKay's Life in a Time of Pestilence, for those of you um, being in Spain who are more interested specifically in, in the Spanish experience, is a simply uh, eloquent and remarkable historical overview of the Great Castilian Plague of, of from 1596 to 1601. Um, this is in the, the last years of, of, um, of uh, Philip II into the early years of, of Philip III. Now, so, so that gives us a sense then of, of when uh, we begin to see how imperial bodies respond differently. And ultimately the Ottoman Empire by the early 19th century is, has adopted a policy of quarantining and, and, and is, is doing that. But it, we, the, the public health story from the 16th to the 19th century is there a question more of administrative um, development that I'm gonna skip over slightly at, at this point. I should note that both with Daniel Penzak's work on uh, quarantines and also the same thing, um, the part of Nancy Gallagher and uh, Salvatore Speciale and others, we see here that public health and how and when quarantines are implemented is always a political question. And that specifically becomes the, the point in the 18th and 19th centuries as European imperial powers throughout the Muslim world begin to use the quarantine as a method of both trying to impose some form of public health, but also forwarding their own imperial agenda and their trade interests and in um, keeping markets open when it benefits them. I'm going to pause here for a second to remind you of something that I said toward at the beginning of this discussion about the historiographical quandaries of looking at the past with uh, an eye to our own current historiograph uh, um, ideological preconceptions, right? There is this remarkable um, uh, trailer online for the traveling exhibition called A Thousand and One Inventions that you can see, which discusses the remarkable scientific achievements of the Muslim world and the effect they had on, on Europe in the creation of the Renaissance and then the, the scientific um, revolution ultimately. And this is a largely an apologetic venture, which is uh, distorts uh, the past in the service of an, a, a notably laudable endeavor, which is to fight Islamophobia and to, um, to forward a greater understanding of the value of, of Islamic traditions in the world today. And so I think we have to be careful here. While you should go online onto YouTube and watch Ben Kingsley act out a, um, a medieval Muslim uh, uh, scientific scholar, uh, it is, uh, it's, it's quite enjoyable. On the other hand, when we want to understand the history of the past, we have to be careful. Contemporary narratives which argue that Muslims invented the quarantine or that it was present already with uh, the, in the Prophet Muhammad's words based on the events of the Caliph Omar and Syria that I recounted before, uh, don't hold up. This again, this is not quarantine. Um, on the contrary, there are those, or on the flip side, I should say, there are those who argue that because of the theological school of occasionalism, that Muslims were fatalistic and that they accepted whatever God had decreed for them. And this is something we find specifically in the 
in the uh, narrations of European travelers in the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries in the Middle East. And while there may certainly have been Muslims who accepted everything that God had, had created for them, I've, I think I've shown you through the work of Al-Ghazali and those who followed after, including al yusi as I'll come to, that one can accept the, the imminence uh, and omnipotence of the divine, while at the same time taking uh, great responsibility and interest in how disease is transmitted and responsibility for one's own actions and for taking care of one's fellow believer at the same time. So I say all of this to make us aware of the fact of the risk of essentializing a religious tradition, of reducing it merely to a few key points or individual uh, scripture, scriptures that can be uh, cited to refute uh, counter opinions or to prove a singular response, and to be aware of the diversity and the dynamic nature of Muslim scholars' engagement with both their natural environment and the scriptural um, sources that they had to work with, including the opinions of their antecedents and their, and their uh, tradition. So, as I mentioned before, the European use of the quarantine in North African ports is used to advocate uh, colonial control from the 18th century onwards. By the 18th and 19th centuries, both the Ottoman and also the Egyptians adopt quarantine. And we find this uh, a, brings us in many ways up to the, into the 20th century into the understanding of how to manage, um, manage disease in the uh, industrial industrial age. And again, I've given people here some uh, pictures of works which I think are, are simply outstanding and how they deal with certain aspects of this. Uh, Christopher Lowe's book on, on, um, on the right here, The Imperial Mecca, focuses specifically on the problem of cholera and in, in related to the Hajj and the pilgrimage and, and how that became a, an issue of, of contestation. But what I'd like to do with an eye to the time and a desire to have a chance to have questions is to jump towards COVID. This, uh, the map here that you have on the right of fatwas, which were issues as responses by Muslim authorities in different parts of the world was, as you can see way back from May of last year, um, the database which is associated with this, which is maintained by uh, the Sharia source team and, and uh, Professor Adnan Zulfikar has now collected over 127 fatwas globally. And when we look at the way in which COVID has been responded to today by Muslims around the world, we find that uh, the vast majority, initially there was some, uh, Pakistan formed a bit of an exception for some reason, but, but uh, the vast majority of these fatwas firmly accept the existence of contagion, call for social distancing, many um, majority of the scholars are calling for the close down of, of uh, closing down of Friday prayer. I mean, this was all by last spring over the summer and the fall, things obviously have changed and um, according to as circumstances have changed much as in Germany where I am now which museums are open and where one can eat changes by almost a weekly basis. But nonetheless, my point here is that looking at the response to COVID in the Muslim world with looking back backwards over the past 1400 years of responses to epidemic disease and the types of sources that can be drawn upon from medical to scriptural, the prior engagements with the responsibility of the Muslim community to take care of, of its own during a time of, of uh, of danger like this, we see here a, uh, the flexibility of the tradition to respond, taking into account the a new um, understanding of, of empirical evidence, the nature of, of contagion, the transmissibility of disease, and to do that with inherited ethical values uh, from before. In this final slide here, um, I just want to reiterate some of those broader points, because in many ways, I think it's while it's important and I'm interested that you take away what I've said this evening about um, Muslim understandings of contagion, about Islamic theology, about the ethical and spiritual impulses, which were largely articulated through a tradition uh, refer and, and, and a social organization of Sufi orders, or which is often translated as mysticism, somewhat inaccurately, but nonetheless in the Muslim world. The broader point that I think that I'd like you to take away, again, has to do with not understanding religion as a static thing, as a static phenomenon, but as a series of discursive engagements, right? As I've said here, a category of engagement with questions of spiritual and social orientation. It's not otherworldly at all, or just otherworldly, shall we say. It always has a thisworldly component, but it drives 
those who represent it, at least in the Muslim tradition, and I believe in all the other traditions with which I'm familiar, to make sense of the transcendent with an eye to the here and now, right? And we benefit today from looking back at these prior attempts to come to terms with the challenge of epidemic disease, not only uh, or not even principally because it gives us some kind of teleological narrative of how the past is bled into the present, but because it makes other forms of rationality of the past that are incommensurable perhaps with our own understandings of disease, for example, how disease is transmitted. We can look back and we can appreciate the human the common human challenge that was faced by these prior generations and the helplessness with which they grappled to come to terms with a, a challenge that, that overwhelmed them at the same time that they marshaled their societies and their individual responses in a way that was as productive as possible in face of that challenge, right? And so I'm going to, um, and, and the reason I have my, my forthcoming book up here is that the central art and the argument of that book, besides giving me a chance to plug it, obviously, it has to do with, with precisely this desire to recover past forms of rationality that may seem incommensurable with our own, but nevertheless reflect a serious and deep engagement with the natural world. And, and that is one example of certainly what was what's the case with, um, with contagion and plague and epidemic disease. The final point that I'll leave you with is a, another passage from the scholar Al-Yusi, um, who I cited previously on his understanding of prophetic tradition. And this is again, 17th century, this is in Morocco, not too far from, from, from where we are here in, in Europe today. And Al-Yusi was hammering home to his audience here. He said, look, the prophet used medical treatment here he's drawing, of course, on the same, the same things that uh, had been known for centuries, goes, goes back in many ways to Al-Ghazali already in the 11th century. But, you know, he says here, there are those who say things like, um, and when it comes to the, what the prophet said about there being no contagion, and we believe that when he was, the, the best way to understand this is that it was an affirmation of God himself being the only one who has any influence. It's not a denial, he says here, of what God's habit causes habitually to occur. It is a joining of the belief in God's oneness with the belief in God's wisdom, a bringing together in synthesis of the reality of the truth with the revealed law. And if there's any better way to just do away with the sense of an incompatibility of religion and science. I'm not quite sure what it is. And so I will, will stop there while I am ahead and take any questions that you may have. All right. Thank you, Justin, for this interesting lecture, for this overview on plague and disease in the pre-modern Islamic uh, world. I would like now to start a small debate on your lecture by uh, asking you some questions uh, submitted by the audience and, and the students. So I would encourage people to write down their questions in the chat. We have the icon here. But meanwhile, I do have a question for you. I'm curious about, um, I mean, we've seen now uh, you have been studying uh, the concept of plague and uh, epidemic disease for many years before. Uh, COVID-19 uh, hit us at the, at the end of 2019. So I would like to ask, uh, how did you deal with the arrival of COVID-19? If you expected something like this to happen or not? And um, how did you connect in a way um, all this historical knowledge you have about pandemic with the uh, uh, current situation we are living now? I would like to be able to say, Marcos, that, that a long academic engagement with the subject of epidemic disease had prepared me perfectly and that I was ready for this. Uh, on the contrary, of course, I basically freaked out and had to deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis, much like everyone else. Um, I will say that, I, that, that having studied it gave me the insight that uh, we knew this was coming. Anybody who reads about epidemic disease, anybody who reads about the ongoing degradation of the natural environment around the world and the greater proximity of wildlife and humankind, anybody for that matter who had ever seen Steven Soderbergh's cont contagion knew that this scenario was, was on the horizon. Um, my engagement with the pre-modern Islamic uh, intellectual and spiritual traditions, um, if anything, had taught me 
the had given me a little bit of, of spiritual equanimity to fall back on in the face of such a disaster in that at least it had shown me that our grappling with this challenge was nothing new. And I think any historian studying epidemic disease is, you know, it, there's some comfort of knowing that prior generations of, of people have had to struggle with very similar things. And I, for one, was at least grateful that this, this pandemic um, did not target the young. I remember thinking uh, with great gratitude last March that uh, this was going to be horrible, but at least my children seemed to be comparatively safe. Um, so for that, I was grateful because there were many other plagues that have not, not been that way. There are plagues that have targeted the young and not, not necessarily the old. And many in the Islamic tradition, we have plagues that are known for striking one demographic group more than another. And that was not the case here. And um, all the consequences uh, around, uh, you know, COVID-19, like, uh, you know, the quarantine, quarantine and, and so forth. Um, um, from this historical point of view, I mean, because um, um, I mean, it's so basic, like uh, uh, the disease is out there, so every, everyone should be at home. Like, um, were you surprised about it? I mean, uh, the main uh, way to uh, stop it was to just, um, you know, uh, um, get people inside their houses and, and keep, um, keep uh, you know, all the activities um, uh, closed in a way. Uh, you know, one, one of the how things did that, you... Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Um, yeah. So I, I put up there for a moment the Ruth McKay's description of the, the Great Plague that hit Castile between 1596 and 1601. And one of the, the most striking things about that, uh, that case is that the same economic problems that we face today were faced in Castile in the 16th century. That is to say, if you shut everything down, people will starve, right? That was the problem then, and that is in a different way the problem the governments have tried to weigh today. How do we balance this? From my understanding of what's happening in India right now, that is another problem. If we have another month-long shutdown of everything, there will be a large number of people who will not be able to get employment, not to be able to get work. And so you're, you're caught between a rock and a hard place as a government. And we've seen, of course, some governments have dealt with this very effectively. Some populations have dealt with this very effectively, and others haven't. Um, and I, um, I mean, I see some questions popping up here in the chat. I can try to... to, to... Yes, we can start by the questions by the students. Alejandra Toro, you mentioned that the past is a contingent by its context. Uh, do you believe that in our time period, people's and society's reaction to COVID-19 is fairly justified, take it, uh, taking into consideration our knowledge and uh, advancement in science? Well, I mean, I, it's, a hard, it's a hard thing to, to ask in many ways. I mean, I, I think like everyone else, I'm very frustrated. On the one hand, I'm, I'm living in a time period with a, a utter tragedy, um, looking around. And I'm often very frustrated with the lack of an ability to get a population to voluntarily mask um, and to take a responsibility for their, fellow, um, for their fellow man. On the other hand, let me point out that a year ago, my understanding of COVID was that it was transmitted via surfaces. And I was taking every piece of, of my groceries and wiping them down before I moved onwards. Today, I don't believe it's transmitted by surfaces at all. So our understanding of science has shifted over the past year. And so in some, on a broader level, if I'm more empathetic with the frequently, um, I feel, chaotic way in which we have responded, particularly here in Europe, where I am now. Um, the, the response has been, not ex has been very frustrating over the last couple of months. Um, I, I have empathy in, in that sense, that it's actually very difficult to organize society, societies in a um, specifically democratic societies during election seasons. It is difficult to organize mm -hmm. them. I think in some ways, the autocratic nature of the Chinese response, for example, may um, have helped in some ways. Not that that means I have any support for autocracy, but it just means that there was more of a clarity of response in some ways, where here, sometimes we've gone one step forward, two steps back, et cetera. Um, and uh, regarding Israel and the effectiveness of the vaccine in the Middle East, yeah. um, small countries with a relatively small populations are easier, have an easier time of it than large countries with larger populations that are much more difficult to roll out um, vaccines. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. 
Um, or oh, the position yeah, of Islam in the vaccine. Sorry, I, I, I'm happy to take yeah. these where you can read them out, Marcos. I don't know how you want to do it. No, no, it's okay. I mean, I, I just wanted to read them because uh, the questions so all the audience can, can listen sure. to them. But uh, yeah, it's okay. So it's, it's, it's Isabel Gomez. She was asking about Israel. And um, which do you think is the position in the religious, political, and scientific manner? Um, I don't know. I mean, my, my understanding is that in Israel, among some of the Orthodox communities, there was a resistance to the taking of the vaccine and some of the measures, and that Israel has had to struggle with that. But this is not my area of focus, so I can refer you to the media for that. As far as Islam and the position of the vaccine, um, <laughs> the I think there was in some quarters a little bit of anxiety about whether the vaccine itself was going to be halal uh, based on the what, what it consisted of. And there were also some questions about whether it'd be permissible to take the vaccine during Ramadan. We are currently in the holy month of Ramadan of the Muslim tradition, a month of fasting. Um, and the, overwhelmingly Muslim religious scholars have answered that the vaccine is permissible and that it's permissible to take it during Ramadan. So that's, that's mm -hmm. the, the general position of a uh, majority of Muslim authorities. Okay, Luciana Viteri, she asks, uh, what do you think about India allowing the Amarnath uh, pilgrimage uh, this year? What is your opinion about the religious ev events uh, and the COVID today? I mean, I, I'm afraid I don't have, have close information about the, the Amranath pilgrimage in India, but I can say that more generally speaking, religious communities have struggled with the epidemic precisely because the basis of religious um, brotherhood is coming together. So whether it be <laughs> evangelical churches in the United States or in, in, in um in, in mosques throughout the Middle East, not being able to come together and to pray together has been a terrible strain for millions of people. Um, many of those communities have found ways to create alternatives. Um, and I believe uh, because uh, there's also obviously a clear imperative to pre preserve one's health, as we've seen also in the traditions that I've laid out here today. So I, I, I descriptively, that's where um, I, I, I I believe uh, the religious communities have not, they've struggled, they have suffered as have, have we all, um, but they have also found ways to continue their practice during this time. Like everything online and so. Yeah, exactly, Zoom, unfortunately <laughs> Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> this other question by Juan Gaitan, in the context of the 21st century, do Muslims uh, believe that epidemic diseases are a challenge to face sent by God himself, although there is a fair understanding of science? So I think that this, is, this question is based on a false premise, right? I mean, I think that um, you can have a challenge to your faith that's, that works through you know, the contagious nature of diseases. The two do not, they do not stand in opposition to each other. This is kind of what part of the, the, the facile uh, science religion binary that I've been trying to speak against a little bit in today's talk. Um, that is to say that, uh, you know, many people, the pandemic is clearly a, a calamity. Um, for some people in the, of, of faith, in Abra the Abrahamic tradition, it is also an opportunity for us to focus on our relationship with God. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it can be that opportunity at the same time that it gives us great cause to grieve and to suffer. Those two things okay. um, are, are not intention. Okay, Juan keeps asking, do you think COVID-19 is being assumed in different ways among uh, monotheist religions? Well, as I've tried to show, um, epidemic disease, including COVID, is interpreted in very different ways in, in one monotheistic tradition, and that of Islam, right? Where we have all these different traditions that people are drawing upon in different ways in order to make sense of this challenge. And so if it's being drawn upon in different ways within one tradition, then that is clearly the case in other, other traditions as well. One of the things that I struggled with in my first book, Infectious Ideas, that I had up there was that people wanted to ask a question of, well, what is the Christian response to this? And what is the Muslim response to this? And I guess one of the things I've tried to show is there is no one Christian response. There is no one Muslim response. And any attempt to force these things into boxes where we can then compare them 
this is the danger of writing comparative history, always threatens to reduce the complexity of these various religious traditions and the societies that practice them. And so for that reason, I would, I would uh, caution us from trying to do that. And it's better here to draw links between the common ways that these communities um, frame and address the challenges that they're up against. And then we'll also get a sense of the greater diversity, a diversity that spreads across these traditions and that does not differentiate them individually. Okay, perfect. And last question by Alejandra Toro again from a, well, not last, last question, we have another one. From a religious point of view, is it possible to come to a better understanding that, that science plays an important role in the natural order without questioning the omnipotence and divine power of a god? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, that's that's kind of what I was trying to put out with that final, with that final um, quote. I mean, you can have, the theologians who will go in, who will do the difficult, and believe me, it is difficult for those people who read theology, the difficult groundwork of laying this out, how it is entirely possible to have an omnipotent and an omniscient and a, 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 a good God, and at the same time to have all of this human suffering, right? This is this is the problem of, of theodicy, right? Of basically, of why do bad things happen to good people? And theologians have written volumes on this. They have us covered. So it is possible to do this. Individual believers will struggle with that in different ways and will buy into it more or not. But theologians have got us covered. It's all, it's all good. If you, if, you, if, you, if, you're, if you take comfort in the fact that some people have worked out how that is possible, it is, it, it is possible. Whether it, it applies to you yourself, you have to, that's a personal, personal journey. Okay. Jorge Preciado, um, he says, thank you very much for such an interesting conference. I know it, it hasn't been raised at the conference, but I would like to know if you can comment on the influence of diseases and plague on the spatial configuration of housing, pal housing palaces, or even cities related to Islam. This is a great question. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to horse you um, for it, precisely because I don't have a good answer. I don't think that there is a good. Um, I don't think that there is until we get within the Ottoman Empire a, a bit of a notion of, of public health. So what you will have, do have in the Muslim world is you have a, a, um, a bedrock understanding of the benefits of, public, of hygiene, of, of, of personal hygiene, of cleanliness, of, of going to the, of, of having well laid out public baths that can be visited and used by both genders mm -hmm. throughout all of the urban areas uh, and so forth. So that is there. But if we're talking about um, uh, you know, the articulation and the creation of certain types of sewage systems and, and whatnot, or I'm not exactly sure, or of, of spacing houses out further apart from each other, of creating wide streets and so forth, then I don't think you do find that, in part because the mechanism of disease transmission is not well understood, um, you know, is not well understood uh, into, until into the 19th century. Um, we do find a broader notion of public health in Europe that starts more, again, in Venice and in the Italian city-states from the 15th century onwards. And I, I am not, one of the things my colleagues in medieval studies have been pushing me to do is to try to help out find something similar to that in the Muslim world. And Nuket Varlik's work on the Ottoman Empire has shown a greater concern for public health amongst the Ottoman authorities, but I'm not aware of, how, of that being reflected in architectural planning which is something, of course, which would have been very salient for this audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, hearing now, he, hearing now about, uh, you know, pandemic urbanism and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, all the urban planning uh, adapted to all these um, future uh, uh, plagues and so, do you think it's gonna uh, be common like uh, in the future to, to try to plan like the cities in a way uh, we can avoid like concentration of people and, and so forth. I guess, I mean, that strikes me. I mean, you guys would know better than I. I, sp I speak here from a position of ignorance and I come to architects. <laughs> it strikes me that that goes, for some people that goes against the very concept of a city, right? So, I mean, this one of the cities I'm most familiar with is New York City. And within New York City, it's going to be very mm -hmm. difficult to understand how the city itself can, can be reconstructed, as opposed to say Berlin, where I am right now, which is actually constructed in a very large, I think it's a massive urban area, which stretches over a huge amount of greenery. And so that now mm -hmm. there's a possibility here for many people to be outside well distanced from other people and feel it feels relatively safe. 
but the whole notion of a city and now you know during the time period i'm talking about it's only a small minority of the global population that was living in cities and so we shouldn't we should even think then that the majority experience of epidemic disease was not in urban areas it was in rural areas mm -hmm. where in many ways the danger of contagion would have been less but we are now living in a, in, a, in a world where the majority of the human population lives in cities. And it's a, it's a very different world. It's one that's much more susceptible to the challenge mm -hmm. of, of, of pandemics. Okay, last question by Isabel Gomez again. Is there any challenge in the concept of uh, Islam related to the pandemic to the believer? And she says, because you explained the idea of taking responsibilities, but isn't people against some concept, concepts of the pandemic? I think we can find people in the Muslim communities as we find them in the Jewish, um, as referring to Orthodox believers in, in Israel before, as we find amongst uh, evangelicals and others in the United States. There are some people who are not at all happy with the measures that public health authorities have introduced in terms of asking them to remain uh, far away. Um, so we find these people, we find people who interpret their traditions in a way where they place their faith in God or in other sources and, and, and do not take responsibility for themselves or their fellow believers. But I don't see this being linked up to any given religious tradition per se. I see this as one strand of many when it comes to interpreting um, these, these faiths. So there are people, but I don't think it as a, a, an emblematic of say Islam or of the majority of Muslims. Okay, Justin, we don't have uh, more questions. Thank you for your fantastic uh, uh, feedback and this amazing conversation. Thank you for uh, accepting to participate in Forum 2021. Thank you all those who have sent in your questions. And uh, yeah, we have our directors back. So yeah, the word is yours. Thank you very much, Marcos. Eh, nada, muchísimas gracias, Justin, por por estar con nosotros, por aceptar la, como dijo Marcos, por aceptar la invitación. Eh, creo que hoy cerramos eh, por todo lo alto el, el ciclo de, de foros, eh, poniendo eh, temas de actualidad, pero visto desde una perspectiva histórica, y esto es bueno para reflexionar y para pensar, la historia siempre es buena para reflexionar y pensar sobre, sobre el presente. Bueno, sí. eh, muchísimas, muchísimas gracias, encantado de, de tenerte. Y nada, hoy es la última sesión, es darle las gracias a, a Marcos y a Albert Gordillo que hizo posible eh, que todo esto funcionara. Y nada, y me despido pasándole también la palabra a Guillem y diciéndole gracias a todos los que están conectados y gracias por habernos seguido en esta serie de, de foros 2021. Pues eh, muchas gracias Justin, eh, me sumo evidentemente a los agradecimientos de mis compañeros y sobre todo por ofrecer una interesante mirada transversal entre historia, ciencia y religión, que siempre es eh, de agradecer y, y ver precisamente esa mirada que va recorriendo todas y cada una de esas disciplinas y las va entretejiendo. Y por nuestra parte, pues bueno, eh, evidentemente sumarme al agradecimiento a... a a, a, todos los, eh, a todo el equipo de foros eh, 2021 Expectations. Esperamos que hayan podido seguir el ciclo y por tanto agradecemos también la participación desde el otro lado de la pantalla y querríamos de nuevo agradecer a todos los conferenciantes eh, su tiempo y su dedicación, a Cazu Zegers, a Santiago Niño Becerra, a Hans Ibelings, a Dalila Rodríguez, a Jorge Reichman, a Jorge Gorostiza y finalmente con el cierre a Justin Stearns. Muchas gracias también a Albert Gordillo, que se haya siempre detrás de la cámara y no, no tenemos nunca su imagen en pantalla. Uh, evidentemente, gracias Marcos, gracias Freddy y sobre todo uh, cuídense mucho y por favor no relajen las precauciones ante la COVID y uh, hasta siempre. Muchas gracias. gracias bueno, muchas gracias Justin, hasta, hasta siempre y nos vemos por aquí, por Barcelona. Gracias Guillén por, bien. Adiós. por compartir gracias. esto. Gracias. Gracias, hasta luego.